Mark Gwen. Uh, and we're uh, thrilled to be here together. Just a, a couple of opening remarks uh, in the hope that they're useful. So as of course, everyone knows, we just concluded COP26 without as much progress on uh, the goals as we had hoped. And one of the reasons um, I, would, I would put on the table for uh, the difficulty in achieving the kinds of agreements that we all had hoped for is this idea that there are there are trade-offs that country leaders and private sector leaders experience between climate action and uh, uh, decent work and economic growth. Uh, and we saw this, uh, you know, perhaps most vividly in Rudy's, um, uh, Professor uh, Durand's country of France, when the president of France sought to put a tax on gasoline a few years ago and faced the yellow vest movement in response, uh, a, a uh, a claims by workers that this was uh, an unfair uh, restriction on their incomes and it was uh, something that uh, became a, a national and international conversation about how to take effective climate action. So uh, our session today is about those relationships, uh, trade-offs uh, and, and difficulties and obstacles. We are extremely fortunate to have uh, wonderful panelists with us today. I mentioned Professor Durant. Uh, Rudolf, or Ru you'll hear us call him Rudy Durant, is the uh, Jolie Family Professor of Purposeful Leadership at HEC Paris. He's the founder and academic director of the Society and Organizations Institute, which he launched more than 10 years ago there. As a scholar, uh, Rudy's primary interest concerns the normative and cognitive dimensions of firm performance, and especially the consequences for firms of, of identifying and coping with major environmental and social challenges, such as those that are uh, on the agenda for today. Uh, Rudy has received the American Sociological Association's R. Scott Award in 2005, uh, the European Academy of Management and Imagination Lab Award for Innovative Scholarship in 2010. He's inducted as a fellow of the Strategic Management Society and he's granted an uh, honorary doctorate from UC Louvain in 2019. He's an advisor, senior advisor, and non-executive board member of many different organizations. He works with firms on their competitive advantages and on developing and implementing social and, and environmental uh, stra impact strategies. Uh, so uh, we're, we'll be thrilled to hear from uh, Rudy in, in just a few minutes. Our opening speaker is Professor Carolyn Flammer. She's a professor of international and public affairs at Columbia and also uh, an associate professor and Dean's research scholar at Boston University. She's an expert in sustainable investing and also the recipient of numerous prestigious awards uh, for her research and teaching. Her research examines how and under, the, uh, under which conditions firms can enhance their competitiveness and long-term profitability while strengthening instead of undermining the system in which they operate and and uh, uh, by doing so play a critical role in addressing climate change and also the other problems that uh, I briefly alluded to, including, for example, inequality and health problems and uh, other grand challenges. The Web of Science ranked her among the top 100 highly cited researchers in the ec economics and business profession in terms of impact over the past 10 years. And certainly she's had an enormous impact on the field of strategic management. Uh, among other roles, she serves as the chair of the Academic Advisory Committee of the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, or PRI, which is the largest network of responsible investors to date. And she's also editor for both Management Science and Strategic Management Journal, and an academic director of a social impact MBA program. Uh, these are just a few of her activities. I also would just briefly want to mention that we had planned for a third panelist, Matthew Pawa, a lawyer who's engaged uh, in uh, uh, litigation uh, to try to pursue climate uh, change abatement. And he was called into court at the very last minute and sends his deep regrets that he can't be with us, but uh, we're going to go forward without him. And uh, I just do encourage anyone who has a chance uh, to hear Matt speak that you take that up because he's uh, incredibly insightful about the challenges that private sector organizations face um, uh, in the, in the um, uh, in the context of climate change. I've asked Professor Flammer to start us off with a few remarks and then uh, Rudy as well, Professor Durand as well, just explaining their approach to these issues. Uh, as they speak, I wonder if you wouldn't mind putting your questions in the chat. We will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end after a couple of rounds of their remarks. So over to you, Carolyn, thank you. 
Thanks so much, Anita, for uh, the kind invitation um, to join this panel. And thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Um, to give you a sense of what I'm doing in the space of climate change, so let me structure this kind of in, in three buckets. One is research, the other one is teaching, and then service and outreach, um, kind of the classic buckets for an academic. In terms of research, I have a couple of studies on, um, uh, on green bonds, um, which are kind of, uh, you know, ESG fixed income instruments, which are popping up like crazy uh, nowadays in trend in finance, so to speak. Um, I also work on the just transition. So how do you tr transition to a low carbon economy without worsening social inequalities? Um, climate innovation, climate finance, and other projects. Then in addition to my own research, I aim to foster scholarship in this space as my role as a, a PhD advisor. Um, for example, one of my PhD students works on climate risks and from strategy. Then um, as an associate editor at Management Science and Strategic Management Journal, I aim to foster scholar scholarship in this space. Um, and I'm also a convener of global multidisciplinary seminar series and conferences, such as for the Alliance of Research and Corporate Sustainability, also called ARCS, and the UNPI, so the Principal Responsible Investing Community. Um, so this is kind of what um, pertaining to research. And in terms of teaching, so I'm teaching a course on social impact, business, society, and the natural environment, which very much discusses the role of companies and their impact that they can have uh, in order to help tackle some of the grand societal challenges that we are facing, including climate change. I'm also, as Anita mentioned before, I'm, uh, I have developed and, and co-directing the Social Impact MBA program at BU, um, where quite a substantial number of students are very much interested in pursuing careers um, let's say in sustainable energy in climate finance in you know at the end of the day how do we tackle the climate crisis right I mean there are many other uh, students uh, with different job aspirations but there is a substantial demand student demand out there um, concerned about climate change um, I'm also co-directing the minor in sustainable energy, which is a BU-wide minor at the undergraduate level. And at Columbia, which I will be joining uh, as of January, um, I have crossed appointments with the School of International Public Affairs, as well as the newly created Climate School, um, which I will, for, for which I will lead the efforts in sustainable investing, both in terms of research, as well as in terms of curriculum development. And lastly, in terms of outreach, um, so besides my role as associate editor, I'm also serving as the chair of the Academic Advisory Committee of the United Nations Principal Responsible Investing. And so some of the aims of this network is on one hand to share the insights of academic research with practice, but also to be informed by practice um, and help guide our research questions and, uh, and the research we're doing. Uh, another aim is to bridge academic silos, which in my view is very, very important to tackle these grand societal challenges such as climate change. And last but not least, we aim to foster scholarship in this space. This includes not only the fostering of high quality research, but also, the f and I think this is again important, the fostering of young scholars, um, because in many cases, um, scholars who do research in this space are the only ones in the department and they might even lack advisors, faculty who, who give them any kind of guidance, correct? And so this is kind of fostering scholarship in this space, especially young scholars, um, helps just helps encourage them to, to keep pushing and keep working on these big, big questions. And I stop here. And uh, I think it's an excellent uh, transition uh, for my first point. So, um, Anita, I think that there, there, were, there were two parts in your question. So first, what we do, and the second part was the basically impediments or limitations that we may, we may face. So I think that, Caroline, you just mentioned the first part of the answer. So I will do the same so that you can then uh, transit to the impediments and limitations section, and I will do the same after you. So about what, what I do, I think that uh, what Caroline uh, said uh, at um, the last point, actually, 
it's one of the reasons why I created uh, actually the Society and Organization Center, which is a transversal center uh, when it was uh, created more than 10 years ago. And today it's an institute because it grew tremendously. Uh, and this transversality, meaning that colleagues from the multiple departments within, uh, within the business school, so it was um, not uh, across schools within the business school, but you had people from marketing, people from accounting, people from um, strategy, organization theory, et cetera, where we're meeting, we're joining, we're sharing their ideas and their projects. Uh, and I think that this is one sort of response that you can give to these isolated uh, colleagues who may uh, tackle the issue of climate, which is a phenomenon and which is not uh, theory based. Um, and so which may represent uh, a difficulty for them. So uh, through this transversal center, we're able actually to first uh, have uh, uh, between 25 and 40 colleagues within the school, including uh, PhD students. So it was a substantial number in, in order just to be able to create a doctoral school um, with the MIT and the University of Bologna, for instance, called Medici Summer School, or some other uh, events, uh, research days, focusing on uh, environmental impact of firms, uh, climate, uh, consequences, climate change consequences for firms, et cetera. So the first thing is just to try to have this grouping of people coming from different parts united uh, in, um, in, a, in a, call it whatever, a center, an institute, a safe place where they can e exchange their ideas and support themselves. The second thing is also once you start having this kind of uh, inf infrastructure, uh, you can develop more content in the, on the pedagogy side. And because this is uh, maybe something that is not a topic that is perhaps not trendy in some disciplines, uh, I think that the first article on, on climate change in, published in Journal of Finance was in 2009, 2019 or something like that. So in some disciplines, it's more difficult than in, than in others. Uh, uh, but this is not true for firms and for some uh, individuals. So through uh, the HEC Foundation, um, we're able actually to, um, mm, uh, to spring the interest of uh, donors, corporate donors through chairs uh, and uh, private donors, individuals who, who actually gave uh, money to the HEC Foundation. And this money uh, actually can then uh, go to the Institute, which helps us develop content. So cases, creation of courses, compulsory courses for 100% of the students at HEC Paris. So for instance, the first when a cohort, which is 400 students for the Grand École program, uh, enter, enter the, the uh, HEC Paris. They don't start on campus. We do four days off campus. And the place where we go, it's uh, in Chamonix, in the Alps, where we go to see the glacier, La Mer de Glace, so the you know, we call it I mean, so the, the ice sea. Um, and this, of course, glacier has lost a considerable amount uh, uh, of, of uh, size, has um, receded uh, you know, from where it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and you can see it physically. And so it's a way to, uh, you know, to, to make it sense uh, sen sensitive, sen sen sensible, I mean, uh, uh, physical, re real to the students to see, uh, you know, the, the reality of this. So whereas you would expect that some of them would know about it, uh, you know, just physically seeing the consequences of climate change on a place in France, which is, you know, quite, quite famous with the Alps, etc., uh, make it vivid for them. And then we have two week, uh, two week long program, including these four days, uh, with conferences, uh, and other um, group exercises uh, around the sy systemic view of the climate change consequences and how firms are part of this of this uh, system, uh, as they, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, take some resources, uh, but also emit, for instance, gas, as we all know, that um, accelerate uh, some of the, uh, these uh, processes from acidification of oceans to uh, 
changes in the in, in the temperatures of the water or of the of the on, on earth so and so we are able with this money just to expose the students but also to develop content i mentioned it cases compulsory courses uh so for instance we have a course called planetary resources uh, that is uh, compulsory for all students where we just really go over all this different scientific based uh, information. And the third point is uh, partnering. Uh, of course, uh, I think that one of the uh, problems, I mean, one of the more characteristics, but we, which is actually a shortcoming of, of, of business schools, is that we tend just to, to be a little bit siloed and perhaps not to but to uh, use uh, existing, uh, um, to reach out and use some existing resources that are just low hanging fruits uh, and with sometimes companies, sometimes NGOs that would like just to partner. So to give you examples for this planetary boundary course, I mean, we've, we partnered with AXA, which is the insurance company that has created uh, a, a series of movies uh, that are very well executed uh, and that we, we use as the material for our course and we have these different scientists um, that actually we are the authors of the of these short movies to come to class and through zoom to be able to be present in multiple classes of classrooms classrooms at the same time so this is an example of partnership um, in um, in the programs of campus and on campus where actually we have the students in small groups to reflect about their the responsibilities of firms and leaders. Actually, we are we partnered with uh, um, the HEC uh, coach uh, school of, of of coach professional coaches, uh, and these are these these people who monitor and uh, moderate uh, actually the work of small groups of students. So this is second year, so it's about eight hundred students. So we have lots of of coaches who are uh, actually uh, part, uh, sharing their time and and uh, and doing this, as much as um, uh, eighty companies who accepted to welcome and dialogue uh, with uh, students by group of four. Uh, so these students by group of four go to the firms and uh, ask questions about. The responsibility of, of firms or how this manage or not manage in firms uh, in relationship with their um, again emission pollution uh, value chain circularity and, and different uh, dimensions that we we all know uh, and they have the students have to to produce a report so that means that this partnering uh, is also very important in order for the business school to be not only producing content but also be open to um, what is happening or not happening, and in that case, diffusing more information about how to change things in in the in the private or some some cases uh, nonprofit or uh, as we work with also some um, um, mutual uh, mutualism uh, uh, type of uh, of companies like some insurance companies that have a different kind of of status. Uh, yes, so this is what I wanted to say. So transversal center, uh, developing content uh, and, and, and building uh, networks to deliver inside uh, or outside the schools, the business schools boundaries. Well, thank you both so much. Um, you know, Carolyn and Rudy, you are um, heroes, I think, to, to many of us, not just because of your, um, you know, your prescience, your early action in this space, both of you, but also this unbelievable energy that you've brought, that you've each brought to, um, you know, changing uh, our understanding of what climate is and equipping the next generation of leaders to be able to, to uh, carry forward in the private sector with some, uh, with some, uh, you know, standing on on the shoulders of our generation, which is really, uh, you know, incredibly inspiring. I wanted to ask, though, <laughs> whether or not you're optimistic that we as a field in general, you know, in education, with this incredibly difficult work of breaking down barriers, I mean, I mean both of you have described trying to change the journals and trying to, you know, make it possible for young scholars to publish in this domain and bringing together, uh, um, 
scholars from a wide variety of disciplines that may speak very different languages and have very different assumptions and very different approaches and criteria for what constitutes success. It's incredible work. Do you think we're, as a field, we are on a path toward making progress fast enough to avert climate disaster? And if not, what else do we need to do to overcome some of the barriers or obstacles that you see? And Rudy, I, I, uh, Carolyn started the last round, so I wondered if I could start with you. Sorry. Yes, sure, I was saying. Um, so uh, optimistic, I'm, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure um, that I will use this term. Um, um, I think that there are lots of positive uh, signals, um, definitively so. Um, um, to mention some of the li limits of what I was presenting just before, and then to, to answer more directly your question, creating a, a, an institute that is transversal, I mean, exposes you to uh, lots of uh, a series of, uh, of, of uh, difficulties. Uh, you also need from inside your organization just to have like kind of a vertical uh, push, so to speak, uh, in order just to uh, legitimize what you're doing and, uh, and, and stressing that it's important for your institution. So I think that within, within the school, that's, it's important. And over the 12 years of, uh, the, since the creation of the, of the SNO Institute, I mean, uh, I could see that there were some, you know, ebbs and flows in this uh, in this uh, legitimating uh, or legitimizing uh, effort. Also, when we say developing content, uh, whether you have an obsolescence sense of, of the content that you're producing. So that means that if you are not able just to have this, um, you know, budget uh, through the donations or through other ways, I mean, uh, other means, uh, well, you, you always need to keep up uh, uh, doing this. So it's a bit like Sisyphus, uh, uh, you know, task. I mean, having this big stone that you put push at the top of the hill, and then it goes back, it comes back, and you have to to do it again. So it's 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 quite difficult. So you have some inherent limitation here as well. And for the partnerships, the same thing. You need to renew them every two three years. I mean, people who volunteer to come and partner, then they change, they go to their own career and do other stuff, and you have to renegotiate all these things. So it's difficult from inside. And so uh, this is one part of the answer. And um, the second part of the answer uh, is, um, am I optimistic? I think that we, um, the corporation in and of itself depend on their governance, who is represented representative of their ownership. So I think that for the last 50 years, and let's say for the business school since the mid eighties, uh, so 40 years, perhaps for the business school, the fact that we associated the firm to uh, shareholder value maximization and that the unique role of the firm was to do that had some advantages. I, let's not deny it. I mean, I think that the benefits uh, of economic growth uh, have been noticeable, uh, especially after the uh, Berlin Wall fall. Uh, but today we observe also that just doing this, which is a, a simplification of what a firm is and uh, of the model of the firm, and this simplif simplified model was operative, it worked, provided some benefits, but today we see that actually the damages that it creates on the natural environment and the consequences on the climate um, need to be accounted for. And it means that we need to act on two things to be really optimistic. Optimist, optimistic. The first one is we, we need to account for these externalities. So oftentimes we tend to stress the negative externalities, but there are also some positive externalities that, that, that are not accounted for. Uh, and here I'm reasonably optimistic because I could see over the last, let's say, well, since the creation of SASB, for instance, which should be 2011, something like that. Uh, so over the last decade, uh, there have been uh, lots of progress. Uh, you see that IFRS is actually starting to promote its own set of norms uh, and that the SASB actually is uh, merging with uh, IRC, in, in, in International Integrated Report uh, uh, 
to create the value reporting um, foundation in order just to promote this standard. So I think that the first leg to be optimistic, which is this accounting of the externalities is, is moving the right direction. Is it rapid enough? Not entirely sure, but still we, we observe a movement. Um, and once you have these metrics, then that means that the investors can invest according to these metrics. So that means that the TRIs, uh, you know, the in uh, sorry, um, uh, the internal rate of returns, uh, IRRs, um, can become more reasonable in the sense that we cannot just say that you want uh, these uh, rates of returns to be uh, fifteen percent, or you know, and so perhaps you would say. And collectively, you would we, we could observe uh, an appreciation for the inclusion of the non-financial uh, performance indicators in the equation that will, in a sense, maximize, optimize financial uh, returns under the constraint of some extra financial uh, outcomes. So I can see that more and more uh, investors are looking at, at this and trying to implement this because uh, their own, if they are private equity LPs, if they are uh, you know, pension funds, I mean, the people that they represent and the, the, the fund that they collect, these people want uh, or ask them to, to do so, to curb a little bit uh, their objectives in terms of financial performance, they still want to have perf financial performance, uh, uh, but to have also some other external uh, extra financial objectives. So when I look at, at, at these two elements, I'm think, I think that uh, the, govern the governance bodies, I mean, the, the ones who represent and speak for the, the firms, so meaning the board members, so you mentioned that I am actually part of some uh, uh, company board, so I, I, I can see this myself, uh, uh, as well as the, the executive committees. So a, a, a series of uh, uh, influences will make that these people representing the firms to be more uh, um, sensitive to these issues and the creation of financial incentives associated with extra financial uh, performance objectives will probably help uh, also uh, in, in this process. Yeah, and the business could play a role in actually uh, opening, broadening a little bit the mindset uh, of the people who will work in the firms, be part of the executive committees and be part of the boards uh, of directors uh, to understand that shareholder value maximization has been an historical model for the firm's functioning that was valid for uh, five decades, uh, but that is just one model and that uh, a truer representation of what a firm is and what a shareholder is, which is just owning some shares of the firm, but not being uh, the only and unique uh, uh, um, recipient and uh, um, uh, of the of the benefits of the firm, but actually also having a role in defining what are the objectives of the firm and the extra financial goals of the, of this firm. I think that this this view will, I think, diffuse a bit more. So that's the reasons why I am reasonably optimistic. Okay, a big wow. reason, a big reason why I am not. It's because this view is mostly European. Uh, you have lots of pushback uh, in the. In, in the in in, uh, in the US, for instance, um, in some rules in allocating uh, funds and investments uh, that um, actually favor for a same level uh, of return the uh, assets that are uh, the less risky, and when you have some climate friendly uh, technologies, for instance, they are today consider as more risky because less probed with less uh, you know uh, past records and so the investors still prefer to invest in some techniques that are less climate friendly because they are more um, you know they know more about it so they reduce the risk associated with the investment so there are lots of you know difficulties so I am reasonably optimistic I, I know I'm I'm, I'm thrilled to hear it. I wonder how you feel, Carolyn. 
Thank you, Rudy. Let me put it this way. I haven't given up the hope yet, and I remain optimistic. Um, I mean, what's the alternative? We just give up? Um, uh, to me, this is not an option, correct? So um, in my view, so I think I, think I shared, broadly speaking, I shared the, 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 the view of Rodolphe, but let me maybe package it slightly differently. But at, at the end of the day, these are pretty much very similar points that I'm going to make. Um, so first of all, I think it's really inspiring, exciting to see the increased attention by everyone involved, by industry, by the, by, by the real economy, by companies, as well as by the finance uh, um, community. Um, but also you see this in ac academic research, you see this in student demand for, you know, broader societal, discussing broader societal challenges, et cetera, in the classroom. You see it across the board, there's increased attention to the climate crisis and more generally the grand societal challenges. So this to me is inspiring and exciting to see. Now, um, with that in mind, I do think there are major uh, obstacles, not obstacles, but I think uh, major hurdles we need to, need to um, overcome to really make progress, to really tackle the, the climate crisis. And I think most of this has to do with our mindset. We need a shift in our mindset. And again, to me, this is not just academics, and in our teaching, but also in practice. So really broadly speaking. So one, on one hand, um, there's much focus on the firm level and for investors is at the portfolio level, correct? We think about the performance of the firm, the performance of the portfolio, but what we really need to tackle the, the climate crisis is a system level approach to think about how does, how does the action of a company or how does the investment really have real impact in terms of tackling the climate crisis? And uh, this includes the development of metrics that help us track progress towards the achievement of these grand societal challenges. Um, and so if you think about it, most of the metrics or most of the performance um, uh, uh, indicators that we look at is, are still at the firm level. Or the portfolio level. So again, I think we need to, sh to shift our mindset towards the system level. Then another shift is needed in terms of there's a lot of talking, a lot of you know making pledges, which is great, but what I'd like to see is actions and real impact. And um, uh, so certainly making pledges like also at COP26, it's a great starting point, but but um, I think what we really, really need is to implement those pledges and take actions. The third shift in terms of mindset that we need and we addressed it uh, previously is shifting away from silo thinking towards um, and, and kind of this me, me mindset. Okay, it's all about me. Um, it's, um, how do I benefit from a shift to, to a low carbon economy or how do I suffer as opposed to bridging silos and, and taking on a collaborative mindset on thinking about how can we jointly avoid the climate disaster. I mean, let's face it, it's not just a disaster, it wouldn't be just a disaster for the climate. It would be a complete disaster for everyone involved, for our very existence. Okay, and so for, for this shift in mindset to happen, I think a good starting point would be to back commitments with actions, uh, transparency, as Rodolfo also mentioned, and honesty. Amazing, thank you, Carolyn and, and, and Rudy, very, very much. Uh, we have um, uh, a great question in the chat from Jody hoffer and thank you, Jody, for the question. Uh, she's asking, and perhaps I, she asked Carolyn, but I wonder if both of you might have a thought on this. And I wonder also if we can uh, hear from Borg also, because you've done work in this area too. Have you published anything about these shifts in mindset or do you know of any publications on them? You know, the, my, the shifts that you just mentioned, Carolyn, toward a system level change or toward action or toward bridging silos. I know that Tima Bonsal has done a little, a little bit of some a blog post on the, uh, 
shift towards systems thinking. Do you know of other work or have you written yourself on these, on these topics? I, I, um, I, I think it is primarily kind of opinion pieces like Timo Banzal has written some great, great articles on, on this shift in mindset as well. Um, I'm currently actually working on an editorial with joint with other scholars um, where I mentioned the shift in mindset, but it's, you know, it's not, it's just an, at the end of the day, this is also an editorial like an opinion piece, correct? Um, and um, the efforts at Columbia will also include this kind of trying to shift the mindset towards more system level thinking. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, um, it's hard enough to break mindset, to break barriers between uh, between business or management scholarship and let's say engineering or you know the hard sciences. Moving, breaking, you know, having conversations, real conversations, for example, with scholars in the humanities or philosophers or historians is yet another challenge. So it's not easy to accomplish. I, I'll try to find I, that. Pardon me. Sorry, I, I totally agree, and I think one challenge. You know, if you if you think now about academics, um, it's the system is not really favorable to that, correct? Um, much of our the system, like tenure track system, you need to get tenure within your discipline, within your silo, and then hopefully you become multidisciplinary after tenure, kind of thing. But it's or if you think about academic journals, they it's really it. it Bridging silos and system level thinking is challenging if you try to implement it in terms of um, um, all these aspects, how we get assessed, how we get promoted. Um, and I think there needs to be also a shift that takes place. And one, one of the rules that I, I see as an associate editor, this is where we can also make a difference. Right? This is where we can help foster this type of research. Um, it's a starting point. Thank you, Carolyn. Rudy, do you have a remark here? And then I wanted to ask Borg your thoughts too. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think we, we do not have a system thinking yet. We, we, but we do have a number of, I would say, sort of uh, spectacular events that is getting people to starting changing the mindset. And the one we just saw in Denmark, um, uh, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, is one of the famous restaurants, Geranium, that is uh, uh, the, the second best restaurant in the world. They have decided that from January 1st, they will not serve meat anymore. And they have a Michelin three star. Uh, so, and that, that gives a lot of attention. So I think it's, it's, we are going in that direction. When I was the um, uh, rector and dean of the whole school of business, we created, uh, tried to create the sustainable business school. And um, the point was that we should not have a particular course in sustainability, but we should integrate sustainability thinking in all the courses. And also we were trying to think about that when I sort of uh, had the graduation, I was trying to uh, get a kind of thinking that you should give the uh, um, management oath that you would be eth ethical and sustainable like the doctors do when they uh, graduate. And so I think we need to start uh, all the way from the bottom and get this uh, mindset. And, and that's not something that uh, is uh, just, uh, it'll take some time. And we did it almost 15 years ago. And when I retired as a dean, the new dean uh, turned everything off. And now we just at Aarhus University last year started to get back to that kind of thinking. So uh, I think the time has come where a lot of people um, are starting to think about sustainability and that re is starting to get the government to, uh, to have uh, sort of more system setups. We also had a lot of uh, support for small companies to uh, um, get into uh, sustainability uh, strategies and business models. Uh, and that is floating all over Denmark right now. And uh, as I told before we started, I also have a small company that is working in that area. So I think it is coming, but it is still slow and we need to push. Thank you very much. I, you know, I've been taking this class as it's, it's not nearly as, um, as uh, a big a deal as what you're doing, but I've been teaching this class on, on, on grand challenges. And this year, the grand challenge that we've been discussing is climate, of course. Last year was COVID. And, 
prior to that, we've talked about things like you know, uh, adequate sanitation in low income settings. The private sectors, the private sector's interests are, I mean, Rudy started to talk a little bit about this when he talked about shareholder value maximization and stakeholder value. The private sector's interests in innovation and in, in pursuing, um, you know, frontier ideas are not always aligned with job creation or uh, with, um, you know, other social goals that are elevated in the sustainable, the set of the sustainable development goals, um, as the yellow vest uh, experience illustrated. So do, do, do any of you have any example, and I know that there's many people who are here in the room who have really uh, powerful insights in this domain. Do you know of any examples of really great and sustain job creation or, or improvements in the quality of life, let's say of frontline workers or essential workers uh, in the interest of, uh, of you know, uh, competitive advantage or, or firm performance uh, in pursuit of, of climate change abatement, you know, through innovation in the energy sector or something like that. Are there examples that we can point to to inspire our students that you can have it all. You can have a firm that actually contributes constructively to climate change abatement and at the same time creates great jobs. Rudy, you just look like you don't want to be called on first. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I, so at, at the center, I mean, the, the center, the climate and earth center within the Institute, we, we have some, we have developed some, uh, some cases for instance, and uh, one of them is, uh, uh, actually, is a company that is producing a technology that it's basically a flexible film, uh, photosensi photos photos photosensitive film that could be used actually to uh, generate electricity. Uh, just so basically, you have so many buildings that uh, are glass covered, and you yeah. could put this film on it and transform basically the glass. Uh, into a photovoltaic uh, cell. Uh, so this is the project. I've been working on this for 10 years. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is potentially uh, uh, creating many, many uh, jobs and having a uh, an amazing impact uh, on, uh, uh, of course, uh, climate change and energy production. Uh, but the, the way we use the case and the and the, the fact this company is is struggling just to uh, have uh, its product uh, accepted uh, um, uh, that will be um, you know checking all the different boxes uh, of the different standards and norms that they have to face etc cetera, etc cetera. so what I mean is that there are lots of examples uh, um, this is just one but um, at great scale, very successful one that will generate um, both uh, climate uh, positive impact and uh, social uh, impact in terms of employment. It's not so easy, I think, to find, but maybe some other people have examples. So to I, share. I think I would have an example. I think if you, um, for example, Revolucular in Brazil, um, let me share with you a link. Um, so this is actually an organization, Anita, you will like to hear this. Mm -hmm. um, one of the PhD students of Anita, who's, by the way, on the market, um, Leandro Bongalupe, he got, um, I've been in touch with him, and he got me in touch with an organization, Revolucela in Brazil. I was looking for consulting projects for my students, MBA students, doing a social impact field seminar. And um, they provide, this organization provides solar energy to the residents of favelas and our privileged um, uh, communities in Rio. And so it is on one hand, renewable energy contributing, uh, you know, in, in fight against climate change, but it also provides um, empowerment, literally speaking, empowerment to the local residents in these communities and it educates them, et cetera. So I think this is one of the very positive examples um, how solar energy and access to electricity can actually help. Um, 
And what is nice about it, you know, I think is the involvement of MBA students and allowing them to also have a positive impact on an organization that aims to positively contribute to climate. Anyway, um, that's you, one Caroline. example. <laughs> I'm glad Leo helped you. I I um I didn't know about that. That's great. Leo is uh, studying himself uh, innovations both in Brazil and Malawi uh, in core systems in low income settings. So basically, for one idea that uh, if we're looking for system change is to make system is to drive innovation in systems systems in places where there isn't that kind of displacement problem of established uh, organizations that resist change. So his kind of core approach, and, and it's really what we're doing here in, in our group is trying to think about that. You know, how can we, how can we innovate in resource limited settings such as Malawi or Brazil to, you know, to, to try to build you know, secure housing, for example, from the ground up, that's uh, climate positive. So thanks, Carolyn, for mentioning that. Jody, I don't, I see your, I see Jody hopper Gattel has a number of amazing points in the chat, but I don't know if you're here. Jody, are you, are you available? I am, but I'm not feeling well in my voice. Oh, crumb. I'll read your, your comment for you. Jody, we can't quite hear you, but our thoughts are with you. We hope you feel better you. quickly. Yeah, so Jody has a, a, a question here or a point here, and please jump in anytime, Jody, about, about kind of systems level, a path, another path towards systems level change, which involves multi-organizational, multi-sector action. So you get NGOs, policymakers, and firms kind of working together, maybe in a particular place or on a particular problem uh, to uh, uh, recognizing their interdependence to try to achieve uh, constructive outcomes. So uh, uh, building relationships to manage that interdependence. And she's asking about org, org design theory and, and what we have to offer. But the core insight here is from, to my eye, a pretty broad one, which is, you know, how do we, how do we work uh, across organizations uh, to, to make important uh, advances here. And I, I wondered if either the panelists or really anybody in the room wanted to comment on that. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> so um, I do think public private partnerships and so there's some, in terms of research now, in ter um, there's some great work being done uh, by especially young scholars, uh, for example, Aline Gatignon at uh, Walton, who looks at pu public-private partnerships um, and the interrelationship and how to tackle some of these challenges, correct? Uh, but I think we need more scholarship in this space. That's my Thank short you. answer. Thank you, Caroline. And there's, there's also some amazing work being done by colleagues of Rudy's and Rudy himself, of course, uh, such as Julian Jordan and Elsa, I'm gonna say her name wrong, is it Kivlinitsi? Kivlinitsi? Yes. She always teases me that it's, it's an impossibility for me to, to, to succeed there, but it, think about the endogeneity of governance forms. When do we want a firm working on a problem as opposed to a public-private partnership or the public sector? Some great work on water utilities, for example, um, uh, showing the endogeneity of that. Keith, uh, would you mind unmuting, please? Or uh, first of all, as you unmute, Rudy, did you want to comment on that? No, I, I, I want. I wanted just to 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 add on this that actually I think that we go back to the organizational design on one side uh, issue and the, and the governance. Um, uh, issue that I was mentioning uh, originally, because of course uh, this uh, public, uh, uh, private public. Uh, Public private partnerships or associations. Um, if you are on the private side, you tend to, uh, you know, um, in a sense, corner the, the public body for them to renew your contract or you try to extract some value from, from them. And so that means that if you really want just to build these kind of collaborations and create some trust in facing this difficult issues uh, associated with uh, common goods or natural resources, 
you don't want to exploit both the resource and your partner's uh, credibility, uh, but really trying to build some to build something together. And this also goes through what we teach, uh, what uh, models we give. Uh, I mean, cases and, and business models we we, we give to the, to our students for them to be to be imaginative. So, uh, Caroline mentioned green bonds. You have social bonds. You have also different ways of financing and incentivizing. Uh, these actions and partnerships to to have a greater a greater impact, but I think this is here the the crux of the uh, of the difficulty of the problem, the mindset and the shift we need to do, and the operational aspects of changing the governance. Thank you, Rudy. Keith, uh, you have a, a wonderful example in the chat. Would you mind unmuting and please make a comment? Yeah. Um... Hi, Aaron. Uh, yeah, I, I say it's really interesting. This conversation is fascinating. So I just joined a private equity firm that's focused on en energy transition. So, and we've got a, you know, and I've had a really different lens on, on uh, what's happening because I think it's um, like you just see where the money, where money flows, um, things start to change. And, uh, and, and so it's been, yeah, those top line incentives for actually putting money and, and because because um, it's really hard to make money out of coal, but it's easy to make money out of renewables now. Like it feels like things are moving much quicker. But my examples anyway, Anita, I'm not sure if it, I, I listened to a fantastic podcast, um, I think it was from Microsoft and just the way they thought about um, thought about their sort of transition was very like very much systems thinking so it wasn't just like how much are we spending it's how much um you know like at, we've got our data centers and and the, the, whoever we're using if we're either running themselves themselves or using people that what are they doing so it's the whole support the, their whole supply chain and different levels of the organization they would look at to really understand um, with, the, with the goal to get to net zero and to get there or and get past that as well, right? To do even better, so start putting energy back into the grid. So, anyway, it was a really good example. I'll, I'll, I'll find it and post the post that podcast. But I thought a great example of how a company would can think systemically about about the issue. And the other other thing is um, was just a, one of the companies that we invested in, which is called Sea Power is really interesting they basically go and help other organizations reduce their demand and reduce demand um you know so basically you don't we don't have to reduce as much energy to to meet the needs and you know and and maintain reliability and they'll work with really big you know like well walmart like um or big data centers that are you know suck a lot of energy they'll work with them and, and bring that down so yeah i mean there's loads of cool things like that around but um you know really good examples Thank you so much, Keith. And it, get, it gets back to this point that Rudy alluded to, which is, so you know, if we want to have scaled impact, the, some the firms that you've just mentioned, Microsoft, Walmart, and so on, working with smaller firms can amplify the scale of the impact of these things very quickly. So we're getting to a, a very, uh, a very um, heterogeneous, heterogeneous. Uh, heterogeneous uh, kind of firm level inter opportunity set uh given the size of some of these large large tech firms especially. yeah one, and one of the other in interesting things i think there's um like a lot of firms producing their esg G report and even though like sometimes that can be a little bit of platitudes but firms are having like it and it's sort of almost an important thing now to be able to say oh you know we've got a report and this is how you know how we're impacting and a, you know, like a, a really basically like the more companies do that are forced to think about it forced to public you know make transparent what they're doing and and make it part of their value proposition to pe empl you know, employees as well i think that's a really nice trend and and something like a simple almost a simple you know point solution that will just keep generating um you know ge generating momentum within the you know within uh, you know, the economy Thank you so much, Keith, and thanks yeah. for being here. I, can I turn to Metin? Metin, would you mind please making uh, your remark? Not sure if Metin is with us. Are you there, Metin? Uh, I, I am. I, I couldn't find my clicker, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, sorry. Um, 
So to, first of all, thank you for another very exciting uh, talk uh, in, in conversation on these issues. You know, not only they are important, I'm very much in awe with uh, all the uh, insights Caroline and Rudy are sharing with us. Uh, one thing that I jotted down is, uh, you know, uh, the, the role of politics. Uh, you know, uh, I might be mistaken, but I feel like the, I mean, if I, from the popular press at least, that climate change among the other goals can become a little bit more politicized than the others. I mean, it's the range is so much. One is, it, it goes from the one extent, it's the most important thing. It goes to other extent to, uh, you know, it doesn't even exist. You know, it is not, you know, the question of degree, you know, if something doesn't even exist. Um, I, I was just um, thinking, what can we do or think about the company, not but be just about companies and the uh, universities look at this. And in a way that, you know, one say that we just educate people, uh, but, uh, you know, I don't know if you follow, I forget the details now, but recently, for example, donors pushed out, uh, a run, you know, somebody running a center at Yale because it was not aligned with their political objectives. Uh, so there is this, you know, little, little bit reverberations of the politics. Um, so one thing, you know, we educate, the other thing is we do research, we take it as something exogenous to us. And you know, politicizing, you know, Rudy will know better in you know, the social social movement literature, you know, politicizing universities is not necessarily the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But how do we engage more meaningfully with the politics in business, in business life, business education, business research? And I already bought the uh, book that Özgecan uh, suggested, it even has design in the subtitle, which I really liked it. Uh, so can you share your thoughts in this direction with us? Thank you, Medin. And before we go back to the panelists, I wonder if I can call on maybe Phoenicia and Ozagon to actually uh, offer your thoughts, and then we'll go back to Carolyn and Rudy. Phoenish? Uh, mine was more a question, but it seems like it was par partially addressed. I apologize, I could join late. It was really this point that Medin's question embedded. Do we have a role as academics in the diffusion of evidence, or is that already a very partisan role for us to take on? Uh, it's not entirely clear, so I would love to hear what the panelists think. Wow! And Azikana, what are your thoughts? My, my thought is, uh, it's obvious. Of, of course, we have a role. I mean, it's just uh, I think it's a piece and parcel to our mission. Uh, I think it's too easy just to uh, just say that we are observers and ex ex explaining things without taking our role uh, and our responsibilities as educators. So, uh, I, for me, it's. Uh, genuinely connected with my uh, vocation and, and profession. Carolyn's I, nodding, I'm sensing yeah. agree. Uh, yeah, <laughs> who could not agree with Rodolphe? Okay, let, let's leave that aside. But uh, no, so I, I agree with that. To me, you know, one important question is, what are the research questions we are asking? How do we engage with practice? But also as an academic to be honest, to be honest academic. So as much as greenwashing is going on in industry, right? So there's um, unfortunately the case, there's a lot of greenwashing going on, but in my view, there's also a lot of greenwashing, unfortunately going on among academics and uh, among academic institutions. And this goes back to um, Metin's point about money, money um, flowing into universities in terms of climate finance or climate change, anything, business education. And I think it's very attractive for professors and institutions to accept the money, but lose honesty. Like, yeah. like in a sense of, I, I, I think I would like to appeal to each one of us, be it as individual researcher, as an educator, but also as an institution to, to if we really care about the environment, about the climate, to also have an honest conversation with the donors and potentially say, we don't have the faculty expertise in our institution. It would be better advised if you send your money to some other institution who actually have the faculty expertise. Um, there is, this is one aspect. Um, but the other aspect is, um, you know, to as an academic, it, it's, it's, it's tempting to accept money into a consulting project um there's a lot of money out there but this is i think goes back to um Borge who said we should take an ethical oath of being honest academics and do research that 
you know, whatever the outcome is, convey this message, but then also to engage and share the insights of our research with practice. Okay, I'm done. I'm done preaching. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Carolyn, it's, 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 it's super compelling, but of course, also very difficult to find a way forward through that thicket of issues, right? I mean, do, do you engage with the intention of trying to influence and change and then sometimes get swept up uh, and, and lose and lose the rhetorical battle, lose the lose the argument. You know, um, how do we how do we find that way forward? I, 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 I'm imagining knowing you, I'm imagining you might say we have to bring our best selves to the effort. And if it's a sincere effort, then we're OK. But um, it's not so easy. It, it, it can grind people down uh, in the process, I think. Rudy, are you? Uh, yeah, here? I'm not. I'm, for instance, about the engagement, I mean. I mean by that that actually we need to study the, the um, I think I mean the, uh, let's say the things that that matter so to speak I mean uh, I would say uh, it, it's easy in some uh, disciplines just to really focus on a big data set and just produce six papers that are I would say all similar but look look like you know around an issue that is a very technical one and that has no impact whatsoever on, on reality and just to publish and to, you know. So I think that all this energy could be turned to some, um, you know, more fundamental uh, challenges that we are we are facing, um, you know. So for instance, that doesn't mean that you should, you know, uh, curb or uh, uh, the, the way you do research. So I'll give you an example. So for instance, uh, one company in the... Um, set of companies that fund uh, the Institute ask us about uh, uh, indices, so for instance, the Dow Jones Sustainable Index and the impact on uh, share, uh, shareholder value. And so we conducted a study and we replicated actually uh, uh, a, study, a study that Olga Own had, uh, had led. And being part of the DGSI World Index, does it have an impact on the share value? No. Does it have a, an impact on the uh, volume of, 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 of trading the, around the dates when, the, when these firms are revealed every, every year? No. So, I mean, so you can turn to a, a phenomenon that uh, is important, that matters for board members, for firms, for, for investors, and find a result that actually is not perhaps based on your own engagement, is not the one that you would like, you would have wanted to, to see. Uh, you may have hoped to have a positive effect uh, on, on share value. It, it doesn't have because the, all this information is already in the public and basically doesn't change much. However, what we found was that the long-term investors were investing more in these firms at the time of the announcement of uh, being part of the DGSI. So that means that, and this is an information that was interesting for, for uh, actually the, inv the investor community in France and, and other places. So that means that you know, there is like the needle, needle, you know, moves slightly. And if you bet uh, and if you invest in this uh, ESG, I mean, CSR activities, progressively, you could have more long-term investors year after year in your capital, which means that you can project yourself for a longer term. And then, you know, so this is not, this is not what we were looking for. We are looking for the impact on the value. Uh, the share value, and we didn't find any. So I think, yeah. So these are two comments I think to to uh, to the to the conversation. I think Musgajan is trying to come in, aren't you? I thought Anita was frozen, so I was trying to figure it. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, my friend. <laughs> So I was going to, like, I think what Metzen raised is a very important concern that we know that people are much less likely to be persuaded by what, by facts, by evidence, if they associate the source of those facts and evidence as an oppos opposing identity position, as an opposing political position, for instance. So, and I see our, role as educators, um, even in the in professional business schools and perhaps even in professional programs in business schools as teaching methods for finding out what the relevant facts are and um, phrasing and positioning the question for 
what organizations' goals should be and how those goals should be um, achieved. Right? So Borge pointed out that sustainability should be a part of every course that gets taught in business schools. And we do know that what gets taught in business schools has an impact. There are, there's research showing that financial models or strategic frameworks that get taught in business schools does influence leader behavior, manager behavior down the line. So I think it is our responsibility to teach uh, about climate change, about other sustainability goals. But I think we need to do it not as like just dumping facts as you know because that might be in in you know in the politicized environment in the us for in particular especially in business schools that, that are getting students and donors who might be suspicious of claims of climate change we don't want to be entering this he said, she said, kind of war, we need to show how science works, how this evidence comes about and how regular folk and managers and leaders can use that, use the frameworks of good science to make their own mind about what their role should be in fighting climate change. Um, in the last couple of years, I've been experimenting with introducing some of changing some of the frameworks that I, I teach core strategy. So one thing, for instance, I do now is not just teach the value stick where we have suppliers and consumers and how value is created and then uh, split and then um, shared across the different parties. So once I teach that, I also then ask students to think about how we would represent other stakeholders in here, not just suppliers and consumers, but let's say the community and how do we represent externalities, both positive and negative. And I bring examples from say Rebecca Henderson's book where she has this data on how much coal costs, um, how, much, how much coal you need to make, how much electricity, and then, um, what is the environmental cost of that, right? So you, if you just show it on the value stick, you see that this is how much profit the, the electricity producer makes, and this is how the value gets split. But then once you think about the environmental consequences, you can see actually that they are actually both um, not contributing value to society, but in fact, taking away from it. So that opens up an interesting conversation and help students look at it in a very different way. So I think we need to be thinking about, you know, I know this seems maybe very minor and, you know, a, just a very little bit of an impact, but, you know, I think that's where a good place to start thinking like Borga said about how we can incorporate these, um, these issues into all the classes that we teach. And- you know, it's, it, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I'm done. Thank you so much. It's very inspiring because if, if what we're going to go for here is mindset change at scale, it does make a lot of sense that we would want to think about our students and the influence that we would have in our curriculum through our curriculum design uh, to make that happen at the same time as we, you know, engage in all these other duties that Rudy and, and Carol were involved with. Gunita, I know that you were involved, you, you and I had a little conversation not too long ago about how you were involved in even the constitution of the sustainable development goals from the beginning. And you've made a comment in the chat that's super interesting about academics partnering with NGOs and think tanks on the ground. Would you say a little bit more about that if you're up for it? Yeah, so thanks, Anita. And I think um, some of the elements of what I was getting at, uh, I think we've already addressed those. I think Caroline mentioned how she was reaching out to Leo, who uh, you know, I've had an opportunity to meet recently and you know learn about his interesting work. And you know, really, uh, you know, evidence from how uh, you know some of your students and what Caroline is doing in terms of you know making those connections with organizations on the ground. Uh, and I think that's really important based on my own experience working with uh, think tanks and uh, research organizations on the ground in India, because even though climate change is a global issue, I think the impacts and the uh, you know interventions uh, are going to be effective only if you know there's good local understanding. So engagement with local actors. I mean, I cannot 
you know, emphasize the importance of that enough because they also have the data, uh, they have, uh, you know, the connections to communities to, uh, to you know, to be able to uh, figure out, you know, what are the what are the kind of research questions that we as academics, uh, you know, really need to be looking at, and also bringing the evidence to our classrooms, uh, because I I feel like you know, many of us are the goodness of our hearts or, you know, because we are genuinely interested in these topics, we are spending a lot of time and resources towards addressing climate change related and sustainable development related issues. But I feel like, you know, we are limiting ourselves to the data that we can easily access through secondary sources. And, and in, some, in, in some cases, you know, maybe, uh, you know, this is good rigorous academic research, but are we really, you know, making progress? Are we really contributing to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, enriching and extending the knowledge and it actually contributing to policy, which is, in a way, I think we can make uh, a difference. So I think from an organizational design standpoint, since we are the ODC community here, it might be worth thinking about some kind of organizational arrangements like the pharmaceutical companies have you know, uh, devised to form these partnerships uh, in a way that we can align incentives, we can align goals and you know, do things uh, with these uh, local uh, organizations and think tanks on the ground. Thank you. Tanish, would you mind uh, just explaining about the link that you put in the chat, please, about that consortium in Europe of eight business schools on these topics? So I just heard about it myself a couple of days ago. So I'm in that cycle of skepticism to guarded optimism. So I don't quite know what this is going to be. So I was actually looking if somebody else might know more about what are the aims here? It, it sounds interesting, yes, but it's so, not clear how they will, yeah, Rudy, maybe yeah, you might know more about so, this. Um, so actually it's eight deans uh, under the auspices, I, I would say, of Peter Tufano from Oxford, who decided just to uh, be present at the COP26. And um, so you have eight European school, INSEAD is part of it, of course, uh, um, LBS, uh, Oxford, uh, Cambridge, uh, SADE, Yes, H yes, HEC Paris, and I hope I'm missing, uh, you know, not missing one. Uh, from HEC, actually, is the Enseno Institute uh, and the um, direct academic director of the uh, Climate and Earth Center, Daniel Albert, who was uh, involved. They produced actually uh, um, five uh, MOOCs, I mean, or um, short videos on different topics, and try to connect the research with the climate uh, challenge. And they want so this was and they were present at the at the COP26. Three three deans actually represented the the the, the, yeah. the consortium. Uh, yeah. So and they 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 would like just to to show that there is probably some that there are some possibilities to to partner. Uh, one of the points I was mentioning at the very beginning is actually the partnering within an, a, 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 a business school with partners outside. But there are also partnership. I think if we want to be at par with the, the, the gigantic challenges that we, we have, I think that we should probably also partner and so and to create some content that could be share, shared. Thank uh, you. Yep. We are at our, uh, yep. at our ending point and I just wanted to, you know, thank you all for being here. What a great note to end on, Rudy, the idea that the organization design community could deepen our collaborations and conversations about uh, this 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 broad agenda of silo breaking and research teaching service everything we do the encouragement of young scholars and the mindset change that and the system change that everybody is 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 trying to uh, advance here so thank you all very very much a uh, special thanks to Carolyn Flammer and uh, Rudolf Laurent for their uh, wonderful insights and leadership today thank you Borge for being with us Finish and everyone who spoke for your wonderful ideas can you, uh, can you say please a word of closing about where we go from here? So firstly, thank you all, all the panelists for doing an amazing job as usual. And to you in particular, Anita, for organizing and designing both this and the previous webinar. Um, we really look to you for inspiration in this domain and you always deliver. Thank you. Uh, the series is ongoing. So as you probably know, the Organizing for Good campaign will go all the way through April 22. So we have a series of these events which try to bring uh, organizational scholars together with people from practice 
on SDG related themes. So if you keep an eye out for the announcement for the next one, I think it's in about a couple of weeks from now, if I recall correctly, but it should be publicized on our website and we hope to see you there. I do want to emphasize something I put in the chat. Uh, if there was a way to collect these teaching materials of the sort that Dosgijan mentioned, maybe others are doing similar stuff, this would really help. So I want to teach this stuff, but I don't know where to start. So if I could find a ready access repository of ways to introduce these ideas into my class, I would be a ready adopter. So I hope this is something we can do together. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.